yeah, I remembered later on that we did not do a clapboard, so uh, that was very helpful. Oops. So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the drop. Today here at DFT, we have a long time dear, dear friend of mine, one Mr. Duck Grossberg, who has played engineered to so many names like Deluxe, Modern Video Film, The Post Group, where he and I met, Apple, so many others, and freelance to just about every super cool, innovative movie that you could possibly imagine. So uh, one of my longest, dearest friends, Duck, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Uh, and I'm sorry, as another super Ted Lasso super fan, uh, we should have left the pitch up for you for the Ted Lasso <laughs> drop set that we had going. Um, so this is Curiosity for Geniuses, which I would say that curiosity is a hard thing to unpack. We are going to do our best, but part of why I wanted this as part of the Geniuses series is because I think, uh, and correct me if you feel differently, but I feel like it's just an inherent part of our nature where we'll walk around, break as many things as we possibly can to figure them out better. Or as you recently said, beat hornet's nests with a stick and see what flies out. <laughs> very, very, very true. Pretty fair. So uh, I don't know how much memory I even have of joining the post group or our first meeting. Uh, Duck did not like me, not even a little bit. <laughs> no. He just thought, who is that loud and obnoxious girl? Uh, which, uh, fun fact, not, a, not an extrovert in any capacity whatsoever. Uh, but I'm sure that was your first impression of me. <laughs> yeah, I grew to love you, though. And I love you back. <laughs> Duck, what were you doing 20 years ago? Um, a little bit of everything, trying to figure the world out, figure technology out, figure myself out. I think I'm, I, I'm a professional. I'm at a professional level in my career, but I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> I, still, I don't think that you'll ever, ever feel confident and like you can fill your shoes. That was, uh, that's a quote that I use often. Uh, eventually Tarantino did join the DGA and I think the PGA, but for the longest time he said, I don't ever want to join anything that says that I'm an authority or like a professional at any of these things. I like being a novice and experimenting and playing and not being behold to a standards and practices, if you will. So similarly, yeah, I don't, I don't know that I feel grown up even as the COO and the CFO of Digital Film Tree. Uh, it's just, I bring some experience that I think serves those capacities, but also for many years, I also wrote like the history of the Air Jordan. <laughs> I was like, cool, I can do that, I'll do that. So for you, kind of take me through, like you, you were our clipster guy <laughs> oh, wow. yeah. at the post group. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I started my career, or started my adventures, probably in the mid-90s. I think I, I grew up in San Diego, and I kind of made my way up north, and uh, was at, wasn't a student at USC, but was kind of couch surfing in the Olympic Village at USC with a bunch of film students. Jeff Flint and Burke Roberts were two filmmakers that I met when I was in my late teens. Um, and was kind of living on their couch and working on their independent films and their student films and just kind of realized like, wow, there's, this is like a thing you can do. You can make movies, you can produce stuff. Mm -hmm. And we started, you know, making student films all over and begging, borrowing and stealing, trying out different formats. Cause you know, as part of their curriculum, they had to shoot on super eight. The video wasn't really a thing. It was just kind of becoming, a thing professionally other than you know like broadcasting you know with the big big studio cameras so we played around with the dv format and we played around with different film formats We're, so you're saying you touched film oh yeah we would beg and borrow to get short ends from productions and people that we knew in production just to experiment and shoot with last of a dying breed and then um we started delivering scripts for roger corman for, I think it was like Concord New Horizon, or I can't remember the name of the company, but we would, we started interning in the casting office and we'd get all giggly, we'd get Mark Hamill's headshot and be like, Luke Skywalker's auditioning for this, this is the coolest thing in the world. And then we would drive around with our Thomas guides at four in the morning, dropping scripts off at people's houses oh and getting lost. <laughs> and, you know, we had to have Riverside, Los Angeles and San Diego County books to go drop things off. And um, then eventually ended up getting a, 
internship at Modern Video Film doing visual effects, uh, like on that Henry and Hal and Flint, uh, working like on Power Rangers and some heavy VFX shows and eventually became an engineer and then started getting out on set and then getting more and more involved. And as digital was becoming a thing, I was that smart kid who they were like, hey, Duck can deal with this, it's a computer. And so we started doing DVD dailies in the 90s and early 2000s and like real cutting edge stuff. Modern was a great place to come up at. Um, and then just eventually led to me fixing things on set for our productions and then becoming a DIT, becoming an on-set colorist, becoming a pipeline engineer and just working on more and more stuff. How would you say, and I ask this because a lot of the people that we know are downloading this are students, like people trying to figure out even where would I put a foot in what sounds like me. And so for a DIT, which digital intermediate technician, digital imaging technician, digital imaging technician, um, why did, because you're, you're gifted in a great many capacities before you were ever a DIT, what led you down that path? We did this shoot for the Academy called Apples to Apples, where we took the we took an Ari film camera and a, the, the Genesis camera, the very first RED camera, all the, the digital technologies as they were converging into the film world. And we worked with this amazing director of photography named Bill Bennett. And he's like the car guy. He shoots fantastic automotive commercials. And so we did like really difficult shoots in every environment where we found like the darkest of dark colored women and the palest of pale women. And, put them in the desert and harsh environments to figure out the dynamic range of the cameras. And we did all sorts of vehicle day and night and tracking shot, shots. And there was this DIT, and it was the first time I heard the term DIT, named Joe De Janeiro. And he was just this fantastic, like he was like a clown at one point. And so he would like bring balloons to set and he would use balloons to find the specular highlights and just started teaching me a little bit about what digital means and how we get the film characteristics in the digital world. And it was just so fascinating to me that I was like, I want to play around with stuff like this. And then I started getting more time as an engineer in color suites, um, you know, providing uh, engineering support to on the old uh, Da Vinci 888 and, and eventually the Resolve and just working in that capacity and started meeting colorists, meeting filmmakers, seeing projects happen, creating digital workflows for TV shows. We were doing a, a show called House and a show called CSI Las Vegas, and they wanted to start shooting um, digital for their, for their B units. So that we started shooting on the Panasonic HVX 200 so that was a combo of film and digital. Yeah. So we would they would they were shooting on house. They, yeah, they were shooting primarily on film, and then they wanted to do like the the scenes inside the hospital room where it was a lot tighter and there was a lot of movement and like recreation of investigative investigative flashbacks. So we would shoot that digitally, and then I was on the team that came up with the workflow to make it look like film and get it into our online edits and start processing it. So we, we came up with a whole workflow for that and started getting digital and film kind of working together um, and just was in the right place at the right time. And every time someone said they wanted to do something, I didn't know enough to say, well, that sounds really hard or that sounds impossible. I thought that sounds cool. Let's see if we can figure it out. That's kind of important. I think um, it touches on a couple of things. People who know well enough to know if something is impossible that I don't think is an attribute that either of us have ever had <laughs> to like say, well, I'm an authority on saying things are impossible. Like that just has not been an MO. I think part of what curiosity has, it, curiosity is almost like a symptom of some of the things that were already in our nature of just, let me find out that that's all, you know, oh, well, I don't know how to do that. Let me see if I can figure out how to do that. And so it's almost, uh, you know, there's plenty of people that came up before us and said, I invented that or I mastered that or that's the way it's always been. And I think you and I are both kind of like, well, if it hasn't changed in a long time, maybe there are faster, better ways to do that. People who have, you know, thought about things in a way that they've always been done or not been open to the idea that, you know, technology progressed without them having mastered it if they just kind of sat in a comfort level with what they already knew, just didn't carve out new grooves in the brain, I, I would say. So for you, what was maybe one of the bigger aha moments or 
I mean, you had your own cart for a long time. That's a good segue into aha moments. Yeah. Um, so we were, I was working on some really big studio shows, helping build dailies pipelines and working on the post side, fixing things and getting, getting media into editorial, getting it finished, getting it through all the processes. And I always thought we could do this better. And that be, better is maybe a wrong word. We, we could iterate on this and make it faster and bring more of it onto set. So I started looking at our key components and trying to figure out, well, what can I take out of the post house? What can I start putting into a cart? What can I bring on set? How can I move things, move things aside? And I was always really interested in pushing the limit and getting things done quicker because I'm not a storyteller. I'm not a creative person I don't, and I don't want to be, but I love consuming content and I love engaging in stories. And so a lot of it was selfish was I want to see more and I want to see more faster. So working with filmmakers, working with directors, directors of photography, uh, photography editors, trying to figure out how to make their pipeline faster and how to push technology was always something that I found interesting. Like I might not be writing the stories, I might not be editing the stories, but I can help you build the tools that let you do it faster and more efficiently. So uh, one of my favorite experiences was Duck being on Life of Pi in Taiwan and India, and uh, the journalist that I am, the whole reason why we have the drop, um, I flew out there to kind of chronicle what you were doing with near set dailies. And at the time, you built like an entire color suite near set, right? Yeah, we built that was pretty fantastic. So, I mean, it wasn't me. I was on a, obviously on a team. Yeah. Uh, but it was through Pace, which is uh, Jim Pace and Jim Cameron's uh, company. And they were an amazing 3D company. And Life of Pi was a native 3D stereo film. Uh, we built an entire production slash post-production pipeline at Pace in Burbank before we even went to Taiwan, and then we, we had to build it modular and mobile. Once we got to Taiwan with Fox Engineering, we also built a screening room. We put a whole pipeline together. To Which, just to date it, that was 2009 or 10? I think it was 2009 into 10. It was a, it was yeah. a long shoot. We yeah. have to be clear, this was not yet normal. This was in no way commonplace no. yet. We did not have like a Bong Joon-ho example yet. So. No, and this was, I mean, I remember um, 21st Century Fox was a little bit timid. This was like a very expensive art film, and they didn't know how big it was going to be. There was a lot of, I, I, oh, I, I hope I don't mess up her name. I think it was Elizabeth Gabler was the woman who was behind the project uh, from the studio side. And there was a little bit of apprehension and there was a lot of studio involvement. We had executives with us throughout the build out. We took over an entire uh, abandoned airport in Taichung, which is kind of in central Taiwan. And we built our stages there. We built a practical wave That's where pool. the boat was. Yeah, we built the Simpsons was there. I'm gonna have to there. find that photo of me like just getting to touch the boat. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, it was a pre pretty amazing shoot. And we built everything to start because this was a very visual effects heavy movie. We There's a lot of groundbreaking work in this with photorealistic animals, um, so much VFX work. This was probably a, the most visual effects heavy film I've ever worked on. So we had to kind of dial everything in while we were doing it because the turnaround on those shots was, there wasn't a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So we were, we were very concerned with color and we were very concerned with accuracy of the visual effects, even in the temps as we were going through, like trying to match that previs exactly and keeping a very critical eye and doing a lot of testing. And it, it, it was pretty phenomenal. And then we had to tear the whole thing down, ship it to India, reassemble it, do the same process in Pondicherry on the east coast of India, then move it all the way up to Manar, up in the mountains on the east coast, do the same process again, then bring it back to Taiwan, go through that whole process for a couple months, keep filming, keep producing, keep getting things back to the US, keep getting things done that we could on set. And then at the end, we had to do that in Montreal. So it was, there was a lot of moving parts. It was, and so we, we had this team, we had, uh, it was Derek Schweikart was his name at uh, Pace at the time. Literally, we kind of begged, borrowed and stealed and took all the equipment available to us that Pace had and we had to build this system. And it was, uh, it, was, it was pretty amazing. 
And then you pivoted almost directly into real steel, didn't you? Was that the next thing or was there a break in between? I think that was the next one. I think I'd come back to the U.S. and as a freelancer, didn't really know what my next move was. And, you know, I had a kid at the time and was really concerned in what I would do. So I was doing some consulting work and building some pipelines, working on commercials. Then I ended up... remember the whole experience of building Gangway Digital? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Trying to build our own company. That was a lot of fun. That was... That was at an unfortunate time where the industry was anything but curious. And even though your cart, your skills, my history in bridging the gap between dailies and editorial, or even finishing, was still just, well, we don't know, and this technology is unproven. And so even though we had all the credentials in the world came like we were almost on a few really big shows there, people just were not comfortable with buying into digital dailies yet, on set, near set, anything. I mean, video villages had popped up so they could watch things back, but trusting something to a cloud to process something on set, and that was 2000, 11, 12, like it was in that in-between time. And you had heads of post-it studio saying, I really want to do this. But sorry, kid, nobody gets hired for hiring, or nobody gets fired for hiring Technicolor. We'd love to give you a shot, but we can't risk our show on you. But I mean, that's exactly why we're talking about this because the the benefits of curiosity, you know, would you agree with this? If you're going to fail, fail fast. Fail fast, fail hard, learn from it, and keep moving. It's a lot of educated risk taking, you know? Nobody's gonna, well, not nobody, plenty of people have bet the farm on untested, you know, possibilities, but I don't think that's ever been either of our MOs. It's, okay, I tried this thing, I tried this other thing that worked with that thing, and then I tested both of those things with another thing on an actual shoot, and it worked out really well. Let me try those things again, with this thing that I already trusted to shoot it and then see how that goes and it worked out. And so that's an educated guess. If you're talking about curiosity, it's not stupidity. Curiosity is testing and testing again. And so I think that's what has long-term benefited both of us. Yeah, like one of the key things I did was early on in my career, I maxed out my credit cards. I took every bit of equity I had. Sounds very Kevin Smith. <laughs> I bought as much as equipment as I can, including at the time, and still it's prohibitively expensive for anybody but a big post house. I was one of the first people as an individual to buy a color front license. And so I would then take my dailies cart with my color accurate monitor, my storage, my LTO for archival, Um, my color front system, and I would start doing smaller shows. I would do little indie jobs, I would do commercials, and I would run it through a big workflow like I would at a post house, and I would generate all my, you know, Avid was was the key component to this at the time. I would generate all my MXF media on set. I would then build all the bins and just hand an AOE in the media off to editorial, and they'd be at the races, and then they'd be able to match back to all of my original camera negatives, because I had all the metadata, I had all the lists, I had everything contained accurately for them. And building that kind of independently, trying to start my own thing, ended up turning into another full circle coming back to modern video film Mm -hmm. and uh, really working with them to build up their on-set dailies department. So I started building carts and and real mobile systems that we would take overseas. I would kind of be a one-man show. I would live in a production office or I would live in the studio like in Albuquerque or um, you know, in Croatia at a resort and Albuquerque or, Albuquerque <laughs> or Croatia. You know, same thing. <laughs> um, Vancouver, and, you know, living in a hotel. And I would have Transpo bring me the mags like they would to the post house. And I would process everything in my hotel room or at the studio and then pipe everything back to editorial in the U.S. And whether like perfect example was at, at Modern, we did some, I, my counterpart who was the managerial level of this was a guy named Greg Chaccio. And Greg and I would try to figure out how are we going to pull the resources and get something from North Africa back to the U.S. And we would investigate every path. And on one big studio show, we ended up finding a, the data center, which is, uh, I think it was N plus one. And this is the super pop for North Africa and Europe. And so we would, I would go every night and I would push my dailies back using their giant pipe 
back to editorial at Lantana in Santa Monica. And then once a week, I would come in and I would send all the original camera negative back. And so I'd, not only would I have my drives and my LTOs that I would then ship back via DHL to the US, but I'd be pushing everything through, through Aspera securely from North Africa. And it was, it was yeah. fantastic. And so we, we would always try to find creative ways to leverage everything. Like we, we did a pilot that um, turned into a big series uh, that we started in Croatia and we couldn't find the bandwidth to be able to get things back to the US in a timely manner. So we ended up contacting the hotel group and saying, hey, how many properties do you have? Can we aggregate the bandwidth from your properties? Set up a connection for me to be able to send things much quicker back to the US. And you know, we we're trying to find creative solutions like that. And we're not network engineers and we're not, but we just, hey, this can be done. Let's figure it out. So, well, I mean, that was how many years ago at this point. I know how we handle things like getting dailies back here. Again, you can go watch What the Fuck is Geopost or What the Fuck is Dailies or Ted Lasso Dailies. <laughs> uh, and you can hear all about how we handle those things now. But how would you handle those things now to cut the, the shipment time? I mean, obviously, yes, if you're pushing them through a spare that's still plausible, but that is terabytes and hours worth of data. And then for backup, I'm assuming maybe you do still want to ship a hard drive, but how are you handling all of that now? Well, every, every show's different. It depends on how big of a show it is, what media we're shooting on, what camera we're using. I mean, are we talking gigabytes or terabytes of data? Are, you know, are we shooting camera raw? Or are we shooting, what, what are we shooting? Um, I'm not beholden to any one solution. I'm always looking for what's gonna, meet our budget, what's going to meet the needs, are there specific bonding requirements, are there, um, does this studio, this production company, this network, do they have a specific requirement? And then I just build on that using best of breed, whatever is currently available. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, I don't think there's anything secret or groundbreaking in how I would do it. It's just putting the right people together and, you know, um, maybe it only makes sense because we're shooting in such a remote location that everything has to be physically shipped. Or if it's maybe we can do some type of proxy, send the proxies over, and then do the final conform with the original media that's shipped over physically. Uh, every job is, is different enough that I don't think there's, there's one solution that meets every job. Do you have any memory of, there went the light bulb, this is what I wanna do? Do I have like an aha moment? No, I did not have an aha moment in my career. I still don't know what I want to do. Yeah, I just realized I was like, <laughs> what an unfair question to ask him because I don't know that I could answer that. Like, you know, what kind of a, kind of a, so I mean, I'm a pre producer here at DFT, COO, CFO, and I, I often even still get jealous when I don't get to be on VFX spotting sessions. So I just, I couldn't, I couldn't say I had, I just wanted to be in it. Like I knew that I wanted to be a part of storytellers. Um, I knew, you know, not to get too sappy and maybe I've already said this in an episode, but like I knew this is where like dreams came to life. And I knew that this is where um, the American dream, like all of the conversations about what happens in America, like you know it because these stories are what taught people English. These stories are what told the stories of people who came here from elsewhere. You know, once upon a time in America, Godfather, like so many of our greatest stories come from this idea of who we are as a people. And all of those ideas came out of this town. I mean, now sometimes right. like Atlanta and Canada, but, like, <laughs> but they came out of this industry. And so I knew I wanted to be a part of that. And, you know, there's a huge difference between looking at VFX from the 70s versus, say, Titanic, which still holds up pretty freaking well today. I've never seen that movie. Really? Yeah, it's on my list of movies I have to see. You've seen Avatar. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> like, but I mean, versus today, where just there's even photo reel previs that happens. And so it's just never mattered to me what the technology was. It was how do I facilitate these stories? I've always enjoyed the collaboration aspect of filmmaking that 
there's so many people that are integral to the process. And I've been so fortunate that I've been glued at the hip to people like Mara Fiore, um, Michael Saracen, um, Claudio Miranda. I've, I've sat, I watched dailies with one of my heroes, uh, Rodrigo Piedro. I mean, like just meeting these people, working with them and helping them tell their stories has always been really cool. And I may not be a subject matter expert in any one place, but I've always kind of looked at puzzle pieces and been able to be like, oh, this person should talk to this person or this technology would probably work really good with this technology. And I think that's the closest thing to an aha moment. I like being part of a collaborative environment and helping people put the pieces together to be able to tell their story in the most efficient manner possible. Well, and that's the thing. Over all the years, I've probably met almost any hero that I had. And I got to say, I've never envied a single one of them because I started young, like 14, I was working with one of my heroes and I got to read scripts and I got to talk about cameras and I got to talk about color and all of these different things that I just kind of took for granted at the time. But it was always impressed upon me from that early aughts that like, look, if you wanna be a writer or a director, the best path forward is to be a lawyer first. <laughs> That's so true. It is so true. And so, you know, I'll never forget meeting Kenneth Branagh on Thor. I'll never forget Michael Bay on Transformers. I'll never forget the just giant Herculean undertakings, you know, that like is a superhero film. Or I'll never forget like even hanging out with Lori Petty on a tiny film called The Poker House, Jennifer Lawrence's first movie. None of it changes you're still fighting almost every frame for your vision because there's finances involved and there's decisions that have to be made for marketing and this, that, and the other thing that just, I don't have that energy. And that's the, that's the crux of it is it's show business. And it is a business, it's a global business, it's a multi-billion dollar business. Mm -hmm. And all of the household names and all of the most creative, wonderful people that have been part, become part of our society and part mm -hmm. of the global stories that we tell they're just people and they're just trying to get through it. Like I, I've been fortunate enough that I've presented and I've been in the room with the, the deities of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Like I did a presentation where I showed the first 4K release uh, or the first 4K process of a film to Steven Spielberg. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, he's a very tactile He told me he liked guy. my laugh. Nice. <laughs> but just sitting in a room working with him as a peer and having him tell us stories of, oh, I remember this day on set and mm -hmm. just going through it. And I had a similar experience with Rob Reiner when we were working on a movie with him. And he's like a historian and he's so interested in all of the, the stories that he's telling that it's like, it's almost like sitting with a professor that's passionate about their work. And that aspect of filmmaking, that aspect of communication is fascinating to me. And that's even more exciting in some aspects than the process, but then getting to be a part of that process is also very rewarding. Yeah. I mean, I say that all the time, that wisdom is not the collection of knowledge, but the dissemination of it. So, I mean, it's this huge, like insane gift that we're still, we're a part of a time where we still have a Scorsese and a Spielberg and, you know, the team of the Reitmans and just so many people that have this mass wealth of wisdom, Ron Howard, James Cameron's like, you know, which isn't to say that, you know, it was better than a time with like a Billy Wilder, or like, you know, any of these, but it's just the fact that we get to be at a time where we get to continue building upon knowledge with people who has, who have already built upon that knowledge to keep it going forward. And we get to be a part of that process. And here we are, the, uh, the assholes with the hubris to say, let's break it and see if we can make it even better. <laughs> Where does that come from, Doug? <laughs> I think it comes from a good place. It, yeah. it comes from the principles of photography are, they're not changing. Those are physics based. There are things, the way that light works, the way that photosensitive equipment works, the way that digital, uh, the, the digital chain works. I mean, Knowing how to do something the right way will always get you the, the results you need, but then how to deal with the formats, the files, the process, that's ever-changing and iterative, and it can always go faster. It can always be bigger. 
it can always be more more of a headache mm -hmm. and that's where I love to play yeah is how how does this medium change how do I how do I get from processing something at six frames a second to faster than real time? How do I just get this out and get this into, into somebody's hands? I think maybe that's it. So it's a combination of knowing the rules well enough to know how we can break them, but also not being so um, beholden to any of those rules to feel as if they're the only thing that can guide you. I don't know how many people uh, run a red light at three o'clock in the morning in a four-way thing and you can see that there are no cars coming. I do. <laughs> but to me, that's, again, it's low risk, high reward. It's, look, this is not a rule that was invented for three o'clock in the morning at a four-way stop, okay? like. I'm not gonna be beholden to something that no longer serves us. There's no reason to be slow or scared when you know what's on the other side of something and testing that theory doesn't, it's not gonna, what's it gonna hurt? So worst case scenario, if I run that red light, I get a ticket because I didn't look for the camera. But end of the day, look, okay, it probably saved me. There are some lights, man, that it's like, it saves me four and a half to eight minutes. <laughs> or Matthew Broderick talking to the camera in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. <laughs> like breaking the fourth wall, the holiest of holies to somebody who is so into the minutia of storytelling and that and the medium of film, but it's fantastic and it works so wonderfully in that context. And mm -hmm. at the time that was a big rule to be broken. Mm -hmm. So do you have favorite toys right now? Everything is my favorite toy. <laughs> I'm not no, I'm not I, I don't have like one piece of equipment or one camera that I like. I think that a GoPro is equally as important to an, an LF Mini. I mean, whatever you, whatever toy you have that you can use right now, that's the best toy to use. Yeah. Um, I mean, I like, I like petabytes of storage. I like multi-socketed, multi-core fast computers. I like GPUs. I like I mean, g given my druthers, I would have hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment in front of me at any given time to play with and poke and prod. Well, sometimes you do. Sometimes you have two twist ties and a microphone. But <laughs> uh, what's the hardest ask that's been made of you? My first big onset color job was real steel. And that wasn't that long ago. It was only a little over 10 years ago. Um, Are we really at the age where we now say that it wasn't that yeah, long ago when it was, it was 10 years ago? <laughs> yes. okay. In cosmic terms, in geological terms, that's nothing. <laughs> that's like, um, no, I, w I was literally brought on to be an onset engineer to support a color workflow and to support a very accomplished colorist. And there was an injury um, that not not like anything you would think of now with unsafe sets, and you know it was mm -hmm. there was an injury that was unrelated to the production that caused the colorist not to be able to continue. And the producers at the time, the director, were like, well, this kid Duck's kind of smart. Have him do it. And I was thrown into the hot seat on a very complicated, amazing film with Sean Levy, who is such a fantastic human being and director, and Mara Fiore, who's a very talented director of photography and an incredible visual effects crew. Um, and all of a sudden they were like, hey, you need to make our film look pretty as we're looking at it. And I literally w went off set for a minute and said, I have to use the restroom, I'll be right back, Where, where's the honey wagon? And I called a colorist that I'd worked with for years and said, what does lift gamma gain mean? Like exactly what does that mean? And he's like, oh duck, what did you get yourself into? <laughs> and luckily I had an amazing crew with me and there's the fantastic man named Glenn Deary who took me under his wing, put me in the truck with his engineers and gave me all the support I needed. Um, and I would read books frantically, I would scour the internet. Um, I, every night at rap, even being exhausted from being on set all day, I would go back to the Dailies Color Room and I would sit with our Dailies Colorist and say, hey, help me, walk me through this process. Yeah. 
Well, and I think we even have, we have those photos in the article that we wrote together, Digital Dailies, The Race to Good Enough, <laughs> which my God, did we get a lot of blowback on that one. <laughs> yeah. uh, we offended quite a few, quite a few folks who were getting into the uh, Digital Dailies game on a larger scale than Duck and I were. Uh, and um, the way that you had I say without, um, or with as much humility as possible, which you help pioneer, honestly, the best way forward so that it wasn't good enough and so that it wasn't um, what we can do. It was the way, it was the way forward. And it took a little bit more time, maybe a little bit more money, neither of which you had, but <laughs> <laughs> made happen. And we have pictures of you in that truck, oh, in that yeah. article. And I remember it's literally you like deer in headlights with a hand on a roller ball or something like it's going to happen, guys. We got this. <laughs> but yeah, we were we were just kind of two people saying, let's figure out how to share this knowledge with people. Yeah, and I think that's important. I think letting everybody know it's OK to do something yeah. you have never <laughs> done before that you know nothing about that frightens you to death. Do it. That's how you learn it. Make the mistakes, flash a mag, ruin somebody's footage, but learn from it, fix it, and move forward. That's, that's my advice. And I've done all of those things. <laughs> yeah. The thing that's different, and I think going back to like the being curious also requires ownership. So I want to know how something works. I want to play with something. I want to try something that I think might work. I have to be willing to raise my hand and say, I screwed up, I mm -hmm. messed this up, I need help. Mm -hmm. And I, I do that all the time when I back myself into a corner. Um, <laughs> because doing things differently doesn't always work the first time, doesn't yeah. always work the second time. But eventually, you know, you learn and iterate from it. And I think that's, that's a big important part of trying new things is not trying to brush under the rug when you make a mistake, not trying to point and say this is somebody else's fault and fear that you're gonna get in trouble. It's, it's hard, but you have to raise your hand and say, Mr. Director, Mrs. Director, executive producer, whoever, I screwed up. Mm -hmm. We need to stop before we move forward because we need to fix this. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I mean, well, let's talk about that for a second because I think most of the people that would tune into this um, are not where again, with as much humility as I can muster, are not where we are. Like, you know, Rami and I run DFT. And so if one of us fucks up, we absolutely own it because it's just me and him and we have to be accountable to our team, but it is up to us to make those educated guesses or those educated, take the educated risks. Um, and similarly, similarly for you, like as an engineer, it's your job to break things, test things, work them out. But that's a real, I would say that's probably the scariest downside for most people is screwing up, is taking a risk that they would have to put their hand up. You and I were not always in the places that we are. Um, I know how I handled it and it was usually uh, so I did this thing, but I also have the fix. Like, we're going to be okay. This is how we're going to move forward. This happened, though. I, I need you to know that this happened, but we're also past it already. Oh, let me, I'll share with you the scariest thing that ever happened to me, or maybe the second scariest thing that ever happened to me. So the day before principal photography on Life of Pi, we had been doing tests, doing 3D tests, making sure that the waves weren't going to make people nauseous, processing material, building DCPs to take to a theater in Taiwan and look at it in stereo and try to judge how we were, you know, we couldn't, we can't break our audience. Mm -hmm. um, my fiber card on my sand took a dump, stopped working. I had no way of offloading media and accessing my main storage pool for, for, the, for the movie going forward. So frantically, I have the machine out of the rack. I have it open. I'm trying to figure out what broke. And the producer, this amazing uh, man, David Womark, came in and was giving a tour of the, um, like a press tour. And on my stop, I have all my computers open, I have everything in a little bit of disarray, and he comes in and he's like, huh, well this is Duck, 
I don't know exactly what he does, but I know we need him. And he's like, is everything okay here? And I just looked up like a deer in the headlights. And I was like, uh, yes, sir. I, I have a superstition that before every show, I like to open all the equipment, make sure it's dust free and aired out so that we don't have any problems. And I was like, oh, fair enough, carry on. And then, you know, the, the tour moved on. And in the meantime, we were, I was so fortunate that my local PA who was, you know, had a huge network in the region was able to, he had a, it was either a friend or a relative that worked at the manufacturing plant oh my God. that made the specific fiber cards that we had and was able to call in and say, hey, can we get a replacement of one of these? And he jumped in the car, went to Will Call at the factory and got us a card that day. And we were able to bring the system back to life. <laughs> but I mean, that was extremely oh frightening. Well, so if I, can, if I can ask a personal question, so you finally get to spend more time, like you, have, you, you work not always stateside, but more stateside than you had been before. You have two boys. I do. How do you, how do you encourage curiosity in them? Like that's fresh minds. Like, are you even cognizant of the fact that you're encouraging curiosity? You know, um, I think my nature, like I'm always tinkering and playing with stuff and I've never become an expert at one thing because I'm always looking at so many different things. I'm really fortunate that we homeschool our children. Mm -hmm. So there are, my wife is always with them or I'm always with them and we kind of guide them in, to, into what we think is the best path for them. And mm -hmm. being kids and being curious by nature, they're gonna migrate towards what actually fascinates them and what engages them. But I do, I present things to my children. I think that I find interesting or I think will be helpful to learn as, the, as a career. So. I want my kids to be more engineer centric than end users. I want them to understand how things work and how to solve problems because I, I'm just afraid that we're going to have a generation of kids that know how to push buttons and know how to send their TikToks and do their whatever, but they don't understand how it works or what's yeah. going on. So I'm always trying to, my oldest wanted a gaming computer because he's really into virtual reality and he plays the esports with his helmet. And I told him, you can have a computer and I'll pay for it and it can be a birthday present or a holiday present, but you have to build it. Well, we yeah, to, you guys built a Raspberry yeah. Pi, didn't you? We started with a Pi and then we went to a big, you know, i9 Intel with a fancy GPU and mm -hmm. all the, the trimmings and the lights and the fanciness. But I said, you need to build it. I'll sit with you, I'll guide you, I'll put, I'll put the thermal paste on for you, anything that you think is scary or need help mm -hmm. with, I will help you with, but you have to do it. You have to understand how this works. Mm -hmm. Curiosity wise, I think that actually is a good bridge to all the other stuff that, you know, I don't, I don't doubt that information reached me because it had truth to it. You know, I'm not like a conspiracy theorist. I'm not a, but if it impacts me directly, I want to know about it. If it's a consequence that I will suffer or endure or an opportunity that I want to make sure I understand before I move forward or dismiss, research the hell out of that. So I think that's the other part of what makes, especially media and entertainment, the post-production side of it or pre-pro with like all the workflows and whatnot, like on a feature film side, you're gonna spend bare minimum six to nine months with these people. You're gonna have to answer, have a reckoning for things that you chose five months ago at some point in certain cases. And then on a TV show, you could be with those people like NCIS Los Angeles, a lot of those people have been on for all 13 seasons. And so research the hell out of it. Find what works for your team. That's, that's all curiosity is, is often sometimes avoiding consequences. That's fair. I think we've nailed it. Cool. Yeah, we went a lot of places in this talk. Thank you, Doc. My pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you next time on The Drops.